This is Sign Language with Bruce Williams and Doc Goldstein. Hi, and welcome to episode 162 of Sign Language. This is Bruce Williams from SignLanguagePodcast.com. Joining me once again from sunny Southern California, Doc Goldstein. How are you? I'm, I'm great. I'm really good. I'm here. Excellent. Is it, is it still raining? No, it's not raining this week. Last week, it was pouring down like you wouldn't believe, and it's amazing that you didn't hear it in the podcast, but it, <laughs> today it was 80 degrees, so I'm not knocking it. Nice. Nice. That's quite pleasant weather. Yeah, it's really nice outside today. It's really good. I went right on my bike. I've got this. Uh, I've got this carbon fiber road bike that I ride sometimes. Oh wow! And I went out on a ride. I went to, not very far, just ten miles, but it was dead into the wind. So I got my exercise. <laughs> you know, uh, so I'm good. Well, hopefully, it made it for an easy ride home. For those bike aficionados out there, it's a Trek Domain with 105, oh, wow. 105 Shimano parts. So it was. Oy, oy, oy. It's nice. Well, look. You know, we've we've had our introductory episode, we've introduced you, and so I thought it would probably be an opportune time, given, given that we've I've, I've kind of rebooted this podcast, uh, it'd be an opportune time to go back to square one and start with microphone types, and, and we'll work our way forward from there. Uh, how does that sound? It sounds great. Okay. One type we don't need to talk about are those little carbon button things that the telephones used to have. Right, we won't. <laughs> we don't need to talk about those. I don't think we're going to encounter too many of those these days. No. Okay, so I thought, you know, probably the first thing to approach would be the different types of transduction for microphones. We've got what we call dynamic mics. There are condenser mics. There are electret mics, which more completely are electret condenser microphones. There's a ribbon microphone, which is like what I'm recording on now, and there are PZMs or piezoelectric microphones. Doc, do you want to start with anything in particular? Well, sure. I mean, we use typically in the, in the studios, we use dynamic and condenser and ribbon mics. And I look at ribbon mics as actually a, a form of dynamic mic, but they do deserve their own category because they break easier than and, and than a regular. <laughs> yes, they can. <laughs> uh, yours yeah. sounds really good. I know what you're using and it sounds just great. You know, it's a great vocal well, microphone. I, I love it. Made in Pasadena, if memory serves. Is that right? I think so. I think Wes's, Wes's company, AEA, I think they're just right up the street. Oh, wow. Well, sort of the other end of the city from you, though, aren't they? Yeah, I'm in Orange County, and they're, yeah. you know, closer to Glendale, or in Glendale. So it's only about, well, it's less than an hour on the freeway, unless it's a parking okay. lot. <laughs> yeah, depending on traffic. <laughs> so electret, electret condensers, you know, we don't see those very often anymore, but I know they're all over the place in cell phones and other commu uh, consumer stuff. Yeah. And in the studios, we don't see them too often, but uh, I remember when I started out, Right around the time that the Donner Party started toward the Rockies, when I started recording, we had a lot of electrets. I know Sony had these nice ones that you put a little battery in and they'd work really good. But these days, don't really see them. So it's mainly, in the studio anyway, it's many dynamics, ribbons, and condensers. And yeah. there's a wide variety in all of those. So, you know, I'm happy to talk about that. For sure. Um, so I've put a few links together, which will be in the show notes for this episode. Uh, and one that I came across is a PDF, uh, which is hosted on Neumann.com. And when I opened this, I, I immediately thought to myself, I'm sure this is an updated version of a, a, an actual physical book that I have on my bookshelf at home. And sure enough, when I came home and checked it, this PDF is actually, in fact, an updated version of the book. And the book is called Microphones for Professional and Semi-Professional Applications. And it's written by Dr. Gerhard Bohr. And he actually worked as an engineer for Neumann uh, between uh, the early 50s and the early 80s. Uh, so clearly, you yeah, know, the guy had some, some runs on the board. You know, he really knew his stuff. Well, he was clearly there at the right time, too. I mean, that's, that's the golden yeah. years. So I will link to that PDF in the show notes, and I highly, highly recommend it for anyone who wants to get their head around, you know, how microphones work and how they differ. Uh, definitely give it a look. It's, it's a fantastic resource. So to start off with dynamic mics, dynamics tend to fall into the category of... Um, well, I'd say electromagnetic because they use a ma they have a magnet, they have a coil of wire. It's like uh, building an electromagnet when you're in first grade. <laughs> okay, I never did that. 
You just wrap a bunch of wire around something, you hook it up to a battery and watch it pick up iron filings, right? Yeah, for sure. It's pretty much the same thing. <laughs> for sure. I wanted to talk about the, you know, the difference between what are known as pressure transducers and what are pressure gradient transducers. So any microphone which is omnidirectional in its pickup pattern, which means it picks up sound from all around, is a pressure transducer. And that design of a microphone has one side of the diaphragm closed off. So sound can't hit one side of, of the diaphragm. It can only hit from one side because the other side's shut off. And that means that regardless of which angle sound arrives from, it can only impact on, on that open side of the, the diaphragm. Uh, and so that gives you this omnidirectional pattern. So sound arriving from pretty much any angle gets picked up equally. What are known as pressure gradient uh, transducers are microphones where the diaphragm is open on both sides and the angle from which sound arrives will have an impact on which way the diaphragm moves and it will also vary the intensity of the waveform hitting each side of the diaphragm. So, you know, I'm, I'm on one particular side of my AEA microphone as I speak, but my voice is hitting the, the back side of the uh, diaphragm as well as the front side. And the difference in pressure when they refer to a gradient, that's what they're talking about. The difference in pressure between the two sides of the diaphragm. And the reason, you know, a figure eight microphone has nulls at the sides is because if sound approaches from the sides, it creates an equal amount of pressure on both sides of the diaphragm. And therefore the diaphragm doesn't move. And that's why you get this null in a figure eight pickup pattern. And it is a hefty null. I mean, the null on a ribbon mic is really, really good. Oh, it's very, absolutely. very good. Just as an example, I will now move around to the 90 degree position of my ribbon mic and you can hear that my voice has really almost disappeared. Um, so you, you, can, you can really hear as I move around this microphone how my voice fades in and fades out. And now I'm round on the back side of the microphone, which has a slightly different sound to the front side of the microphone. Still sounds really good, though. Backside sounds good. Oh, great. yeah. I find it amazing, you know, just fascinating the way you start with two basic polar patterns, omnidirectional and figure eight. And by implementing these two, uh, or overlaying them, I guess, uh, in microphone designs, they come up with all these alternate polar patterns, like, you know, hypercardioid, supercardioid. Does that make sense? Yes, and today I'm using a cardioid microphone. Bruce has this really expensive, really cool AEA ribbon, and I've got a really good but lesser, uh, lesser priced uh, SM57 Sure microphone, which is a cardioid, and it doubles as a hammer. And uh, it's a really, <laughs> it's it's a really good microphone for many things. It's my favorite snare drum mic, although not everybody yeah. will not everybody will agree with that, but I like it for that. And uh, it also works pretty good on guitar amps. But it is a cardioid mic, so if I turn if I can't really move where I am, but if I was to talk into the back of it, you wouldn't hear too much coming out. No, not at all. Although the the null at the back of a cardioid, I think, is probably not quite as intense as the null at the sides of a figure eight. Oh, I agree. I, the, si yeah. the, the null on a figure eight microphone is amazing, and it's great. Like if you have a, if you have a guitar player, acoustic guitar uh, singer who's going to sing and play at the same time. A couple of figure eight mics can really help you isolate those two tracks from each other if you aim one to only pick up the guitar, but it's 90 degree pattern is aimed at the singer. And then the one on the singer is picks up the singer, but you've got the 90 degrees off aimed at the guitar. And it's amazing how much isolation you can get that way. How much separation you can get. Yeah. Oh yeah. Definitely. Anything you want to add on polar patterns, Doc? Well, one thing I one thing I, I tell people that I'm that I'm teaching, which I, I unfortunately for some I do that. If you see a microphone that's got no way for the sound to get to the back of the capsule, there's no vents around the side, then you can pretty much be sure that that's an omnidirectional microphone. But on the other hand, if you see little cutouts behind the capsule 
so that sound can get in the sides, then it's probably a cardioid unless it's got a pattern switch on it, in which case you can play around with it. And I, I also tell people that if you have a lesser expensive condenser microphone and it only has one diaphragm in it, that's a dead giveaway that it's going to be a cardioid as well. Yep, absolutely. Usually. Usually. If <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Because yeah, yeah. there's always going to be an exception to every rule, but that's typical. Yeah, for sure. So we could talk about the, the relative sensitivity. Like one of the things that, that I talk about a lot to people is how much more sensitive the condensers can be. But that's not always what you want when you're recording. Sometimes you want less sensitivity because you're trying to work with leakage in a positive way. And sometimes you want it and sometimes you don't. Uh, so one of the choices that you make when you use different microphones is not only what it sounds like unto itself, but also how sensitive it is and what the off-axis frequency response can be. So maybe we should talk about off-axis frequency response because that varies widely. Sure. Okay. Uh, you, you've probably got a little more experience than me in, in this particular area, so take it away. Well, like, for example, on a drum set, well, I would usually use a small diaphragm condenser like a KM-184 or maybe a AKG-451 or two. On a hi-hat, I would usually aim that mic on top of the hi-hat looking straight down at the cymbals and not try to slant it away from the snare drum. Most people would think that, oh, well, why don't you aim it away from the snare drum? But they're forgetting about the fact that the off-axis frequency response won't be as good in the high frequencies when you do that. And I'd rather have a little bit of leakage from the snare drum than have a compromised frequency response on that microphone. So typically, yeah, right. I'll aim it straight down. Meanwhile, on the snare, I've got a Shure, which doesn't get much of the hi-hat. So, you know, because it's not as sensitive. Yeah. So when, you, when you're talking about miking the, the hi-hat in that sense and, and aiming the mic straight down, are you using the physical size of the hi-hat to actually block the snare from being visible from the microphone? Yes and no. I mean, I usually, I usually have the mic faced opposite the, the snare drum, of course. I don't have it right next to the snare. But the fact of the matter is the snare is going to be loud enough to where it's going to get in there no matter what you do. Yes. <laughs> it is a condenser yeah. microphone. And I know that there are some people that would use a dynamic mic on the hi-hat in order to uh, try to get rid of some of that snare sound. But for me, that just never works. And that's just my own opinion. So right. uh, I live with I live with the leakage. Uh, that's what yeah. EQ is for and all those things. So how is the frequency response affected by different microphone types? Well, you've got that article from Neumann, and I haven't looked at it, but if you go to the Neumann website and you start looking at the specifications and it shows the polar patterns of the microphones, you'll see that it usually, for all those mics, has uh, a frequency response versus what frequency it's measured at, polar response. And you'll see that as you get up above 4K to 8K to 16K, the pattern starts to degenerate a little bit. It just doesn't work as well at the ultra high frequencies. And that can, uh, right. in my opinion, that can, that can deal with clarity a little bit, can hurt your clarity. So I'd rather have a nice clear hat. And then, you know, it's also possible that later in the mix, I may not even use that hi hat track. That could happen too. Sure. But if I'm going to record it, I want to get all of it especially in the high frequencies because I want the symbol to, to be crisp. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And do you do you find yourself during mix down rolling off a lot of bottom end for stuff like that? Well, I do. I do. I'm not one of those people that has a rule that says always roll off bottom end except for, you know, bass and kick <laughs> and things like that. I know there are people out there that, that kind of have that rule, but my rule is more like what's it sound like? You know, does, yeah. it, does it need a filter? Does it need the phase shift that a filter induces in the analog world? You know, so uh, I'm not afraid to use these things if I need it, but I don't have it as a rule. But hi hat, I typically will put a 75 hertz a high pass filter on that. Yeah. You know, because it just makes sense to do it. I don't need the low frequency from that particular microphone because I'm going to get plenty from the kick mic and from the overheads anyway. So yeah. Yeah, exactly. Is this going at all where you hoped it would go in terms of microphone? Yeah, yeah look, I mean, I, I love having your input because you you bring a completely different point of view to some of this than than what I do, uh, and I think that's great. Well, you're very de you're very very detail oriented, and I'm actually not. You know, I, I'm more, <laughs> you know I'm more of a wide angle shotgun kind of guy. You know, and I think that's good. <laughs> I think that's good because. Uh, 
I understand the detail stuff, but I don't focus on it as much. And, and uh, that's probably a weakness of mine, but um, it's just the way I've always been. So, Oh, look, I think, it, it, you know, as long as you get the job done, that at the, at the end of the day, that's what's most important is that you, you, know, you know how to find the tools and you know how to use them. I just have a very inquisitive mind and I'm always always looking to understand why things work the way they work. Yeah. For me, it's never it's never been enough to be told, here's this microphone, go and put it on that source, and then not knowing why did someone choose that microphone over any of the other microphones that were in the cupboard? You know, what was it about this microphone that made it the most, you know, natural choice for this particular application? You know, I like to know that stuff. Well, that's a really good, that's a good, that's really good to know because over time as you record, you know, you sort of build up this internal library of what what sounds like what when you start putting different mics on things. And after a while, you kind of build up this truth table in your head of, oh, okay, well, this situation calls for this microphone unless I want this other type of sound. And, you know, so experience coupled with your kind of knowledge is is really great that way. So, yeah. Yeah. Are you familiar with the name Mike Stavro? It rings a bell, but I can't place it. He's he's an engineer. He's... um. Cypriot by birth, comes from Cyprus, and he lives in Australia now, and I guess one of the biggest hits that he mixed was uh, Brass in Pocket for the Pretenders. Uh, And for a long time, he contributed to an audio magazine here in Australia called Audio Technology. He used to write a column for them. He doesn't anymore. But along the way, he wrote a book called Mixing with Your Mind. Oh, yes, I've uh, heard of that. Yeah, which I've mentioned a few times on this podcast. It's a great book. And again, for anyone with an inquisitive mind like mine, uh, I would highly recommend it. And one of the things that he covers in that book is the notion that different microphones have what he calls a hard sound and a soft sound. And and that there's this whole range, you know, if, if you were to draw it on a number line from one to 10, where some of you really cheap mass-produced Chinese condenser mics can be quite a hard sound. So he might rate those as a, as a 10. You take something like a, a ribbon mic, they can be quite a soft sound uh, or a warm sound. And so he might rate those as a one. And, and he rates pretty much every microphone he ever encounters. He, as you, you, you were talking about, you know, that mental database that you build up over time. Yeah. Yeah. You know, with every microphone he ever encounters, he he sort of allocates it a number somewhere on that scale from one to 10. And he talks about the idea of when you listen to a sound source that you need to record, whether it's a human voice or it's an instrument or, you know, whatever it is, uh, he, he talks about analyzing that particular sound and assigning it a number on that scale of from soft, warm, rounded kind of sounds to really, you know, harsh, screechy sounds, you know, at the extreme end and assign it a number and whatever number you deem that sound source to be on that particular scale of softness or hardness, you should try and find a microphone that's sort of at the opposite point on the number scale. So if your sound source is like a six, you'd look for a microphone that was a four if your sound source was a, a one, you know, it was a very soft, mellowy sound, then you'd, you'd go for a harder type microphone because he, he finds you go with a soft sound source and a soft sounding microphone, you're just going to end up with something that just sounds woolly and dull and muddy. Uh, and likewise, if you're you know, trying to record a sound which is quite a hard, abrasive sound, you know, maybe you know, like a, a, a trumpet or a saxophone or something, and you're using one of those cheap Chinese condensers which has a very hard response in its own right, then you end up with this sound that is just really harsh and screechy and, and it seems like nothing you can do will tame it. Well, I've never looked at it that way from a number system, but I, but I do use the concept of, uh, of if I have something that's really warm, I'll use a mic that has a lot of clarity. If I have something that's screechy, I might pull out a ribbon mic. Uh, for yeah. example, if I've got a Marshall amp and it's really in heavy and fuzz and harmonics to the point where it just hurts, <laughs> and, I, and I don't mean HZ, I mean hurts like pain, yeah. you know, yes. uh, 
you know, that's when a ribbon mic can really help because it doesn't change the frequency response much, but it does dial down the amount of pain that you might get from another microphone. So, you know, I get yeah. where he's coming from. And although I don't use a number system like that, I'd have to say, what happens if you get a sound source that's, that's a five? Does that mean you can't record that day? <laughs> I, I guess somewhere in his, you know, his database in his mind, he's he's come across some microphones that he deemed to be right in the middle and that you would use a microphone that was pretty much in that range of hardness and softness as well. So it's kind of like bang in the middle. And I don't know, maybe a U87 sits right in the middle. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I don't think so. I think U87 has a little bit of high frequencies there. And sometimes you wouldn't want to put that on a, on a source that's too bright personally. I, I found, sure. and this is just my own opinion, but I have found that typically with condensers, I'm either looking for an honest reproduction of what I'm recording, or I'm looking for something different than that. And it could be either probably 50 for 50 50 in terms of what I'm trying to do. And if I'm looking for something that's an honest reproduction of something, I'm probably more likely to go with the small diaphragm condenser, whereas a large diaphragm condenser tends to accentuate the top a little more. So, you know, I would not record car keys, which is a really hard thing to record for converters, by the way, I wouldn't yeah. record car keys with an 87. So, and, th and that kind of takes me off on a little tangent here. If any of you listeners out there are trying to figure out what, you know, analog to digital converter you want to buy, try jangling some car keys in front of a microphone and recording that and see which converter does the best job. Right. Because you'll find out really quick which one cannot handle it. Wow. But does that come down to the sampling rate and the bit depth at which you're trying to record? Oh, you know, I'm not sure. It just, some, some uh, converters just really just lay down and die when they try to do that. I think it probably has something to do with the harmonic structure and the, and the uh, transit response, but don't, yeah, don't, right. don't quote me on that, but it's a good test of converters. Cause if you can get a good sound out of car keys, then you ought to be able to get a pretty good sound out of a cello. <laughs> That's all I can say. That's that's very interesting. Um, but I do want to just backtrack a couple of minutes. You, you said that sometimes you want to record a sound faithfully and sometimes you don't. I'm interested to know, when would you not? Because I'm my, my before you before you answer that, I'll give you time to think of an answer for that. While you're thinking of that, my approach to the way I work, and maybe this is just a reflection of the industry that I'm in, is always to record something as faithfully as possible. And then, if you want to mess with it, you you do that during mix down. I'm I'm keen to know at what point would you not be looking for a faithful reproduction of the sound source from a, a given microphone. Usually pop music, because pop music, you're not about um, reproducing exactly what's happening. You're about creating a sound, something that, that works. And it doesn't really make any difference if the sound you're creating is a faithful reproduction or not, as opposed to authenticity, which is what you'd want if you were doing bluegrass or 50s or bebop jazz. jazz. Yeah, 50s <laughs> bebop jazz or any kind of jazz. Classical music, there are times when you do really want a faithful reproduction, but there are other times when that's just not that big a deal to get that, and you're looking for something that works with what you're doing and what fits the music and what fits the situation. There's plenty of times when it won't matter to me if it's realistic. I'm more interested in trying to find something that works for the moment. Yeah, nice. Nice. But I'm a post-production person, so keep that in mind as well, you know? Yeah. yeah. It's interesting because as a photographer – you know, some of my key mentors over the years ha have all espoused the idea of get it right in camera, you know, reduce the amount of post-processing that you need to do. So, you know, if you want the lighting to look a particular way in the finished image, do everything you can do to capture that at the time that you push the shutter button, because then you're not going to have to spend hours and hours in Photoshop later on. That makes total sense and I to absolute, me. That makes sense. It does. And I absolutely subscribe to that approach when it comes to photography. And yet when it comes to audio, I, I tend to go in completely the opposite direction, which is capture everything as faithfully as you possibly can, you know, at the time of recording and then, you know, worry about how you're going to post-process it, which is I'd never noticed 
you know, the, the, the difference in approach uh, across those two disciplines of photography and audio in myself until right now. Uh, <laughs> I'd, <laughs> I'd never noticed it. But, um, you know, I really, yeah, it, it's, if, I make, if I make a decision while I'm recording in a certain type of microphone that is not authentic, but it's the sound I want, then it's, ma- it's that much less to do in the mix. You know, I'm, yeah, and I'm I've already heard there. Other engineers say that too. Yeah, so I'd rather get it. You know, I've heard, I've seen engineers, I heard engineers, some of them say that as they're working, they have the mix in their head, and sometimes I do too. And if that's the case, if I know I want something to sound a certain way, and I have enough, you know, I don't want to say belief in myself. Let's say arrogance. If I, if I know that. <laughs> <laughs> that I'm not going to change later, then I'm just going to get the sound then and there. And that includes on my EQ going in or something like that as well, you know? So, cause I don't want to have to make a whole bunch. I don't want a thousand decisions during a mix. That's why every time I do a guitar overdub, I, I just don't need to have 10 microphones from six different angles, you know, and then worry about it later. Yeah. I, ju- I just don't, I don't need to do that, you know? So yeah, my opinion. It's interesting over the last couple of weeks since we recorded the last episode uh i've oh that reminds me i wrote to larry about uh the tape op podcast uh and and about (laughs) and about how i was uh intrigued at the the notion of releasing it without any uh compression or limiting and he wrote back and he made reference to somebody else who, who obviously was you know doing whatever mastering was applied to that podcast uh i didn't know who that person was but he said you know that that was his decision to to release it that way and i said okay fair enough you know not uh having a go at you just was interested in the uh the the mental approach uh but the reason that sprung into my mind was because uh larry has since released the second episode of the tape op podcast which was an interview with jack white well known for white stripes and a bunch of other projects cool and he was talking exactly about this notion of he quite often will work on an eight track system simply because it stops you getting out of control you know he said i i doesn't want to end up with you know 40 tracks of guitars and then have to you know go through it all and try and work out what's worth keeping and what's not worth keeping he'd much rather limit the whole session to eight tracks and say you know we've got to get this right and you know we're we're gonna track you know the whole drum kit to a stereo pair and and that's it there's no post mixing of the drums (laughs) well you know (laughs) i totally understand that that. it makes a lot of sense you know the the whole thing about having digital audio workstations is just because you can have 300 tracks doesn't mean you should have 300 tracks really exactly you know uh, exactly so there is that you know i'm always reminded uh you know, you, you've probably seen the the video of John Lennon singing "A Year in the Life" or "Day in the Life." You know, with uh, with the tape echo on while he's singing, and I always remember no, that. No, I haven't. And I always remember that because the tape echo coming back to him, so they're recording it wet. Well, the tape echo coming back informed the way he did his phrasing. You know, if they had wow. waited to add the the slap later, he probably would have sung it differently. So. And I'm not saying that yeah. everybody should go out there and record all their reverbs and echoes, you know, wet. I'm not saying that, but I'm just saying that that's a good example of how it can help you to get the sound you really, really want. And in a way, that's sort of like your concept on photography, except instead of getting a perfect reproduction, it's about getting as close to what you finally want it to sound like as you're recording it. Yeah. Very interesting. We got away right. from well, microphones. I- we, we did get away from microphones. Yeah. yeah. What was that about pressure gradient again? No, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, look, I, I wish I could talk more coherently about polar patterns. Um, I don't exactly understand the way they come up with hypercardioid and supercardioid and all these different variations of polar patterns. I understand that it's a, a, a superimposition of your, your two basic patterns and that somehow using more of one and less of the other creates different polar responses to different microphones and i really need to read up more about that stuff i think it's very interesting the way it's done um well i'm the same way I, I, i don't get into the weeds about how they design the microphones you know i'm not that that's not my part of the reel as they would say uh yeah i just take advantage of their work 
You know, there's a there's a <laughs> limit to how much you can you can know about any subject, and and when it comes to actual microphone design, I'll leave that up to the West Dooleys and the Normans of the world. Yeah, <laughs> maybe I need to adopt that approach a little more. <laughs> no, you don't. No, you don't. I think it's great. <laughs> you know, I, I said to you before we went on uh, the podcast, I said that it's really funny because you're much more detail oriented, and I'm more of a shotgun approach kind of person. So between the two of us, maybe we'll end up at a, at five. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. For sure. I guess I wanted to, at some point in this discussion of microphones, come back to those people who are podcasters or home recording enthusiasts and kind of give them some guidance on how do you choose one microphone over another. Now, I guess my first and off-the-cuff response to that would be, if you can, get yourself to a store which has a decent collection of microphones that will allow you to try them out and to hear how different microphones behave under different circumstances. And I think we've sort of addressed the the notion that I, I hear some people say, oh, you know, if you're doing voiceovers, you absolutely, you've got to have a condenser mic. And I absolutely do not agree with that. No, I don't Even agree though- with that. I don't agree with that. No, even even though at at work at the radio station we only use condenser microphones in the voiceover recording field where I am. Which ones? Well, <laughs> there's an interesting story here. Uh, I have a, a f- about a 40 year old U87, which was my main microphone up until the middle of last year, and I've been at the company now for eight years, and I no- I started to notice around early parts of last year of 2016 that this microphone was starting to sound like there was just a little bit of grit and distortion starting to happen in the upper mid-range and I thought to myself well I've been here eight years I know this microphone is, is at least 40 years old and I know it's never been serviced in the eight years that I've been here so it's probably due so I went and spoke to the chief engineer and i said look you know this u87 that i'm using it hasn't been serviced in the eight years that i've been here is there any chance you know we can send it out for a service because it's starting to something's just not sounding right not only a service but i'd give it a halitosis check while you're at it (laughs) what's halitosis bad breath you don't, oh, okay. <laughs> you, you don't know who used that microphone before you. You don't know. Oh, absolutely. So he said to me, well, look, I'd, I don't know where we'd send it. If you can find out, you know, get us a quote. So I said, okay, no worries. So I went off, did some research, found out that Sennheiser Australia are now representing Neumann in great. Australia. That's great. That's good. So I contacted them and I said, look, this is the story. This is who I am. This is what I've got. Uh, we need it serviced and checked out. And so... They said, okay, send it over, we'll do a quote, and we'll you know, we'll get back to you with the quote before we do anything substantial. And I said, okay, fantastic. So the quote came back and basically said, it needs a whole new K87 capsule replacement. Um, so even though the microphone is called a U87, the capsule inside it is a K87. And so... Turned out it was going to be fourteen hundred dollars to get in Australian uh, to get this new K eighty seven capsule installed and a general service of the whole microphone in the process. So the chief engineer said, "Yep, fine, go ahead, get it done." And I said, "Okay, that's great. What have you got for me to use in the time that the U eighty seven is off station being you know fixed?" And he said, uh, "I can give you this." And he gave me one of the Rupert Neve designed SE microphones a 2200a i've seen those i haven't used one but i've seen them mate that thing blew me away this is a 500 hundred dollar microphone you know so it's it's certainly not expensive as you know nice condenser microphones go and i took it down put it in my studio plugged it in and had to listen to it and just went wow that sounds nice and then uh, one of the voiceover guys that i work with on a regular basis who's somewhat of an audiophile himself, he came and had a listen to it and spoke into it and did a few reads through it, and he was like, wow, this is beautiful. And I went, yeah, it's great. Well, Rupert, okay. Anyway, and let's face it, Rupert yeah, is Rupert. You know? Exactly. The first, exactly. The first time I met Rupert, it was all I could do not to kiss his ring. <laughs> Thank you for that mental image. <laughs> you know. <laughs> 
the guy, the guy is just so good. And uh, we had, I had a student bring in a, a Rupert Neve direct box not too long ago. Uh, just oh, last. okay. And it was a great sounding direct box. I think he paid a couple hundred bucks for it. I don't know what that would be in Australian money. Probably close, right? Uh, probably about 300. Really? Mm. Yeah. Well, it sounded really, We're- really good. So there is that. Yeah, nice. Yeah, I think I think it's about a dollar fifty Australian to the US greenback at the moment. Okay. So anyway, eventually, you know, a month later, we get the notification that the microphone is ready, and we organise a courier to bring it back to us. Here's the kicker: what is now essentially a brand new U eighty seven, because yeah, let's face it, it's got a brand new capsule in it. I put it up alongside the SE. Yeah, I know. And, where I know where you're going. And I said, I said, no, nah, I'm staying with the SE. Yeah. And the U87 now sits in the corner of my studio as my backup mic, or the mic I use when I have to do a two voicer. That's <laughs> so, great. Well, you know, the old older 87s do have different electronics. Children, you, you you out there that have an old Neumann, if you you know you can tell if it's an old or new design, if you take the case off, there's a battery compartment in the older ones. You know, if you see that, right. if you see that, then you know it's an older Neumann. And I think there's a little bit of gain difference between the new AI version and, and the older version like you have, but I think they both sound good. Uh, I know there are yeah, people oh, on the internet yeah. who, who won't agree with me, but there's always somebody on the internet that doesn't agree with me. But I think <laughs> I think both mics sound really good, but... I'm not shocked to hear that you like the the Rupert Neve mic because uh, you know there's more than, there's more than one way to to record something and I totally am with you on the fact that you don't always have to have a condenser uh, to record yeah. voiceovers. I totally am with you on that. Well, I think yeah, you and I are, are living proof of that. You know, you're using a, a 57 and I'm using a ribbon mic, uh, both of which are dynamic microphones. You know, so there's. I I think we we put paid to the argument that you absolutely have to have a condenser. You don't. Well, I'm not exactly a singer either. Trust me. You- <laughs> <laughs> Same. <laughs> you know, so that's just not happening. Okay, a man's yeah. got to know his limitations, and that's one of mine. So now I, I'm interested to know whether you can shed some light on on this particular aspect of the difference between dynamics and condensers. What is it that makes a condenser? so much more sensitive than a dynamic mic. Well, I just think that when you have a capacitor, which is what a condenser is, when you have a capacitor fully yep. charged, it doesn't take very much to cause a lot of current flow in and out of that charged capacitor. Uh, and so when you move the, the diaphragm and it changes the capacitance of that quote-unquote condenser, it just yep. doesn't take much for that thing, especially if it's got a good solid charge on there and there's a lot of electrons in there hanging out and they got nowhere to go and nothing to do until you come along and start singing. And then they get out yep. of Dodge really quick. So that's, you know, my highly technical uh, description. <laughs> you know what? At, at the beginning of this episode, I really should have covered the difference between how dynamics and condensers are built. We kind of, you know, Doc glossed over it quickly with his analogy of, of wire and magnets and whatnot. Yeah. A dynamic microphone has a diaphragm, you know, and the diaphragm is the part of the microphone which responds to an incoming signal, you know, a, a, a wave front, a, pr- a pressure front of air, uh, which is a sound. It hits that diaphragm and it makes the diaphragm move backwards and forwards through its point of rest. Uh, so when a wavefront initially hits that diaphragm, it moves away. And then as you know, the waveform, depending on frequency, goes into a low pressure system, the diaphragm then swings back through its point of rest uh, and towards you know, the sound source. And then it, you know, and it keeps on vibrating backwards and forwards. Now that diaphragm is connected to a piece of wire which has a coil and that coil is placed around a magnet. And as that diaphragm moves backwards and forwards, it causes the coil of wire to also move backwards and forwards around that fixed magnet. The magnet doesn't move, only the coil of wire around it does. And the process of that coil of wire moving backwards and forwards relative to the position of the magnet induces a current in the wire. Does that sound accurate so far, Doc? Yeah, sounds great so far. Yes. Okay. And so what that 
induced current does is cause a flow of electrons through the wire. And, and of course, that then leads out into your microphone cable and off it goes to your microphone preamp. Now, a condenser microphone, on the other hand, works on the idea of a fixed plate inside the microphone behind the diaphragm. And that fixed plate is fed with a current, what we refer to as phantom power. Now, if it's coming from a battery as DC, it can be 9 volt or it could be 12 volt and I think some are 24 volt. Uh, but usually that's that power supply will actually come from a desk or from a mic preamp, which could be rack mounted. It could be yeah, wherever it is up through the microphone cable and into the microphone. And what that current does is create, well, well, basically it feeds that current through the back plate. Now, when a sound hits the diaphragm of a condenser microphone, it causes, in, in much the same way as it does with a dynamic, it causes that diaphragm to move backwards and forwards. And the difference in distance between the diaphragm and the back plate creates a variance in the conductance between the two, well, I was going to say plates, but essentially between the diaphragm and the back plate. Am I on track so far, Doc? Well, by definition, a capacitor is two plates uh, separated by a dielectric, and that dielectric just means something that isn't conductive. So it can just be air between the two capsules. And, it's, and you've got this fully yep. charged, you've got phantom power going up to this thing, and it's fully charged. So as soon as you do anything to change the value of the capacitance, then you're going to initiate current flow. And it doesn't take much to change that capacitance uh, as opposed to a dynamic mic that you have to move all that mass of the coil and, and have it right. do its thing through the permanent magnet that's there. So condensers are very sensitive for that reason. Right. So I was just about to say, so that kind of explains why dynamic mics tend not to be as sensitive as a condenser because, as you said, you've got to move all that mass of the diaphragm and the coil of wire where with a condenser you're only moving that diaphragm and it's the decreasing and increasing distance between the diaphragm and the back plate that causes the the flow of electrons it's got nothing to do with actually moving a great mass right right yeah right so cool let's talk about phantom power so my favorite joke is well they call it phantom power because it was invented by somebody named casper you know that's not true I just <laughs> I just want to say, uh, but yes. <laughs> I think they call it phantom power because the voltage comes right up the mic cable, so you don't really see that there's a power supply being used at all. And to, yep. in today's world, that's going to be 48 volts coming from the power supply that supplies it through a 6.8K ohm resistor. So there's sort of a, a standard there that says, oh, well, I'm going to need X amount of current in order, in order to uh, make this microphone work. A microphone now might have an inverter inside or some other way to change what it gets from phantom. But as far as you and I are concerned, if the mic needs phantom, it's probably going to be that 48 volts through a 6.8K resistor through two of them, you know, one to pin two and one to pin three. And you can't right. hear that because of common mode rejections. Uh, you know, hopefully we're not going to get into too much common mode rejection, but because uh, that's a whole, that's another rabbit hole. You know, the weekend. Yeah, that sounds like a whole different podcast. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But basically, the mic won't amplify something that it sees exactly the same on both pins two and three, hot and cold. It won't, if it's the sure. same thing, it won't amplify it. So the phantom power doesn't cause hum in the microphone. It just powers what needs to be powered. And you don't see it. And Casper's happy. What can I say? <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. All right. Well, look, I think we've probably exhausted this for now. <laughs> Beat it to death, you mean? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Look, I, I hope we didn't get too technical. And if we did, please reach out and say something. You know, if there's any part of this conversation that you feel we glossed over too much, then it's probably because we hadn't done enough research. Please come back and say, hey, expand on this bit or expand on that bit. Well, I think we need the Lucky. listeners to keep us in check. We need the listeners to tell oh, definitely. us what they want more of or less of. You know, you and I had briefly offline discussed maybe we'd get into preamps too, but I can see that that's not going to happen, which is fine because we have another podcast in another fortnight, right? That's right. <laughs> that's right. Uh, and you know, and there's there's you know there's a whole podcast just in 
stereo miking techniques, which will come further down the track too. Oh, you know? yeah. So oh, yeah, 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 yeah. There's so much fun stuff to ahead of us. So, um, yeah. But look, if we've if we've glossed over anything in this discussion of of microphone types, polar patterns, phantom power, please sing out. Let us know, and we'll do our best to uh, rectify that in an upcoming episode. I have a final thought that I'd like to share with everybody out there. Go for Cause, it. Because I get this I get this question a lot. If you're starting out and you're going to be recording. And let's say you're starting to buy some equipment and you want to know what you should or shouldn't do. Let me just say this. No microphone is perfect. So if you're thinking that you're going to get one good microphone and you're going to use that for everything, I would recommend against that because every microphone has its own frequency response and tone. And if you just use one mic for everything, then everything you record is going to have that same dip or boost at whatever frequency that microphone has. So... Uh, I would just say, instead of getting one expensive microphone, maybe get three that aren't so expensive so that at least they all don't sound exactly the same. So you're not just repeating the same frequency response error across every track that you record. Definitely. And I think that kind of harkens back to Mike Stavro's uh, thing about hard sounds and soft sounds. And, you know, as you say, rather than spend everything you've got on one killer mic, you know, maybe buy three mid-priced microphones that sort of cover that range of you know something that's got a bit of a warmer sound to it something that's sort of middle of the road and and maybe you buy a a cheap chinese condenser for that kind of harsh brittle sort of response you know because there are times when that's the best microphone for the job you know depending on what it is you're trying to mic especially if you're trying to mic car keys (laughs) exactly (laughs) all right doc it's been great once again thank you thank you and we will uh, we'll t- talk to you again in a couple of weeks. I'm looking forward to some c- comments. So, because so, I-, I really feel that we're kind of flying blind a little bit. What do our listeners want to hear? What do they not want to hear? I really, personally, I-, I really could use that. Sure. All right. There it is. Let us know. And we'll uh, we'll talk to you again in a couple of weeks. Okay. Bye. See ya. Sign language. Another audio to you.com quality podcast. For questions, comments, and feedback, email the boys at signlanguagepodcast.com.